It's important to learn to laugh at ourselves. Don't take life too seriously. If you put two and two together, you will see what our friendship is for. The Jerry Halliwell of today is almost unrecognisable from the 21-year-old who catapulted to fame as Ginger Spice back in 95. She's sort of this icon, this modern icon, because she's so shocked everyone because she came from like that ditzy girly band thing and she just totally turned it on her head and became this kind of like, you know, modern woman who's like changing things and doing things for the UN. You just walk in, I make you smile. It's cool, but you don't even know me. Jerry started out as just another street smart teen with dreams of becoming a superstar. She was very hungry for fame when she was younger. Jerry was quite focused. She knew what she wanted, she knew where she wanted to go. There's something in you, it's almost like you've got to have Enough pain and enough love, enough insecurity, but enough confidence. It's that mix that makes you go out there and, and seek it. Ultimately, Jerry reinvented herself as Ginger Spice, the girl power dynamo behind the biggest British pop phenomenon of the 90s. But then, with the Spice Girls at their peak, Jerry walked away. And the next thing I see in the newspapers, you know, Jerry leaves, blah, 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 all this stuff. And so I thought, oh, you know, I lived and breathed every moment of being in the Spice Girls, I really did. And so and then suddenly, you know, I was out on my own and I had to rebuild my life. Jerry's story begins in Watford, where in 1972, she was born the youngest of three children. My family were very, very poor and I really felt it. But the funny thing was, I decided I wanted to go to this uh, kind of an all-girls posh school up the road. I was 11 and I thought, I want, you know, to get out of my surroundings and, you know, and get better. Jerry's father was disabled and unable to work. Her Spanish mother supplemented the government's benefit by working as a maid. When Jerry was just nine, her parents divorced and tough times helped to make her a dreamer. So I used to um, like tell awful lies to my friends to try and make myself feel more interesting. Like I used to say I was born on a plane. I'd say I had sheep in my back garden, and just, but really the reality was the wallpaper was falling down and we had no money. But in a way that made me go towards television and movies and music because it was my escapism. That's what made me today, I think. Growing up, young Jerry always had a kindred spirit in her father. Although he couldn't provide for his family financially, he did manage to fan the fires of her showbiz dreams. Yeah, my father took me to a talent agency when I was about six years old, and I got home all really excited. And my mother, she says, I don't want you to be the next Judy Garland. You're going to, you know, and end up killing yourself. You're not allowed to do anything till you're 16. So, by the time I was 16 years old, I was gagging to get out the door and do something about it. The problem was, I didn't know how. The only thing I had was my radio and watching movies, that's it, and my own imagination. Jerry's burning desire to become famous drove her to drop out of school. Because I just couldn't wait to get out to that big, you know, big wide world. I felt that, you know, I was being held back, I, it was suppressing. <laughs> Jerry moved to London's Soho. If she was going to realise her dreams, she needed to be right in the heart of things. I think when you're, when you're a teenager, you're so much more fearless. And from the age of 16, I'd moved every six months. I have lived in bed sits and squats. I've been homeless, I've slept. I was like the artful dodger. I wanted to make it. To make ends meet, Jerry worked a series of dead-end jobs. I worked in a chip shop, I worked in clothes shops, I worked on a market store, I had a paper round, I had a bar job, I taught aerobics, I ran a gym, I was a glamour model, as a topless model, just like for bums and tums, nothing too sordid. Jerry was a good model, I mean, Jerry had a sort of natural ability in front of the camera. It was that strength of personality that came across, I think, you know. Glamour model means that you're prepared to take your top off and maybe do a nudie shot. They like girls that are kind of, they've got shorter bodies, so you've got to be very curvy. You've got to have, you've got it an arse, you know, boobs and bottom. And I was trying to get money, get money for a demo, which would cost 300 pounds, which was a lot of money for somebody that didn't have any. 
As she struggled for recognition, 18-year-old Jerry found herself faced with the biggest scare of her young life. One day I found a, a lump in my breast. It was the size of a Smartie. And I knew that I had a history in my family as, of breast cancer. So I went to the doctor and, um, and he was very swift about it and took it out immediately, like within two days. And so I just basically, luckily it was benign, I moved on and didn't really give it much thought. This time she was lucky, but the subject of breast cancer would be the catalyst for a major change later in her career. In 1993, Jerry got her big break as a host on a Turkish game show. And I had to stand on door number one or two and go, love that fridge. Love it like you've never loved it before. The game show provided Jerry with the exposure she desperately needed. And soon she was providing exposure of her own kind. And I met a girl who told me about how you could earn £200 an hour, you know, if you took your top off. It turned out that she'd been a dancer in a quite a raunchy nightclub in, in Spain. And you don't have to be tall, and the money's great and regular, and it's fantastic. So I thought, oh, I'll do that. And the thing is, but the novelty wore off very quickly, and it's, I found it a bit demoralising after a while. Jerry tired of taking it off, and before long, it would be her career that would be taking off. For five years, she worked a wide variety of jobs in and around Soho in a quest to become a star. But the sudden loss of her father in 1994 threatened to derail Jerry's dreams of fame. When my father died, I was absolutely gutted. I was distraught. You know, I was just got into a continual state of d depression and over analyzing everything. And I got starting just getting anorexia as, you know, just did not want to live in, the, you know, in the, the real life. I really didn't. I didn't want to interact with anybody. Jerry lost her boundless drive for success just at the time when maybe she needed it most. It took me about six months slowly just, you know, coming out of it. You know, I nearly didn't go to the Spice Girls audition. Nearly didn't go, which was quite mad. After months of grieving, Jerry rose out of her depression and continued her search for her big break. In 1994, she knocked on the door that would take the ambitious girl from Watford where she'd always dreamed of being, the world stage. Basically, they put an advert in the stage newspaper and to manufacture a band. It's a bit of a funny old story, the beginnings of the Spice Girls, because although there was an audition, it wasn't actually an audition for the Spice Girls, it was an audition for a girl band. I went to it and there was 12 of us and um, we got put into two groups and I knew I was put in the reject group, I could tell. The producers soon realised that Jerry had talent and picked her first above the rest of the hopefuls. And although the group's creators had a vision, the girls had other ideas and took matters into their own hands, girl power style. And then we went on to form the Spice Girls. We started writing our own stuff. Then we went on to get a new manager and then we signed to Virgin Records. If you wanna be my lover, you have got to give. By 1995, the combination of the Spice Girls and their new manager, Simon Fuller, clicked. Within 18 months, the Spice Girls had scored six consecutive number ones and went on to sell over 30 million copies of their debut album, Spice. In fact, they even made their own movie. For a while, Earth had truly become Spice World. Oh, I mean, the whole time I've been a Spice Girl, it's been non-stop. You know, we've worked so hard and we've been all over the world about three times. We did things that you wouldn't, some people don't do in a lifetime. You know, meeting Mandela. You know, for goodness sake, this is, a, you know, one of the biggest icons of our time. They are all great because they all went out all the time and had a good laugh and that exuberance went into their stage performances and they really liked each other and got on and stuck together and, you know, girl power and stuff. As the Spice Girls chased fame and fortune, they flew the banner of girl power, a slogan that made them icons of womanhood to a legion of female fans around the globe. I believed in girl power. I put my heart and in hand on my heart and I totally believed what I was saying, I do. It was tough for us because at the time in Britain there was a, a big boom on boy bands. So that's why we, we, you know, we created the girl power movement. 
and I really felt like we were on a mission and this is for girls to join in and it was honest. I think it was probably one of Jerry's, Jerry's ideas. She's, um, she's pretty good with ideas. But in 1998, at the height of girl power, a struggle broke out within the band. The girls fired their manager, Simon Fuller, and took control of their own careers. We decided it was a collective um, decision to leave Simon. None of us were happy. And, you know, we went on to look after ourselves. They were a little bit scary uh, to be with, and they dropped their manager by then, and they were a bit, they were kind of making people sign um, secrecy things. But Jerry's interest in the band was waning. She'd become increasingly occupied with charity work, specifically breast cancer awareness. We got some information that she was about to leave the band and um, it was front page news for about four days. I mean, it's an absolutely huge story here. And just walk away. Jerry wanted out, so she made plans to leave the band after a sold out American tour in September 1998. I thought that would be so dignified to end it like that. The end of the American tour, you can't get better than that. You know, you've done it. You know, we've brought it to the max. But the ongoing business of the Spice Girls kept interfering with Jerry's charity work, and things finally came to a head. And the point came when I was unable to do a breast cancer interview. And I thought, you know what, I've got to do this, you know. She went to the girls and said, look, you know, I've got a big opportunity to try and do some good and make young people aware, more aware of breast cancer. And the girls said, you can't do the interview. We've got a TV show to do ourselves. So um, I thought, you know, this isn't for me anymore. It really isn't. I don't have a right to get on stage if I can't, you know, speak about such an issue. So I just, I thought, I've got to leave now. You know, this can't wait for three months. Jerry thought, you know, this was a terrible way to be treated and put her foot down and just decided to walk out because she felt it was compromising her, her principles. Jerry decided to leave the band earlier than scheduled, right on the eve of their big American tour. Um, well, you know, when Jerry left, it was a very, you know, very crucial point of the Spice Girls' career. It's like when you leave a marriage, you can't say, oh, we got divorced because of just one particular reason. And the next thing I see in the newspapers, you know, Jerry leaves, blah, 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 all this stuff. And so I thought, oh. The band may have been upset over her dramatic exit, but Jerry had focused on a more important mission. The defining moment of why I left when I did was because I obviously I had that breast cancer scare when I was 18. I was currently reading about um, a lady who had suffered with breast cancer, got misdiagnosed, and she died. If one person, you know, saw me interviewed about breast cancer awareness, then that's possible one person's life saved. When Joe left, you know, we couldn't replace her. You know, there's only one ginger. Credit to the other girls, they wanted to continue, and they have. You know, we had to be very professional, we had to get the show together, we had to re-choreograph, re vocal. Basically, we've just got on without hair. And so and then suddenly, you know, I was out on my own, and I, was, I had to rebuild my life. Gotta slow it down, baby, gotta have some fun. So, in May of 1998, at the height of the Spice Girls world domination, Jerry put girl power to the ultimate test. She quit the band to pursue a new role, this time as a spokeswoman for breast cancer awareness. And she did this toast, she went, no more big hair, no more big shoes, no more big And I thought that was great, because that was like goodbye to Ginger, and on to the next thing. Change, it kind of challenges who you are, whether you can deal with it. It tests you know, how confident you feel about yourself. I think she lost a lot of confidence when she left the Spice Girls and, and she had to win some confidence back. I think that was the single biggest hurdle. As her confidence grew, so did her reputation as a celebrity with a social conscience. In late 1998, the United Nations asked her to become a goodwill ambassador for reproductive awareness and population concern. And I was like completely astounded because I never get picked for anything. I'm one of those people in the back of the class going, me, please pick me, please. And for one time in my life, somebody goes, here. I guess the thing is that people listen to her. It's not just because she's Jerry Halliwell and an international star. It's because of this, this quality that she has of, of, of openness, directness. She's a, a big personality. And it was just what I needed, and it's a lifelong project. It's basically bringing awareness that everybody around the world does not have the same rights. She's going to be a real asset to us and, to, and a real benefit, I think, to the, to the people who, to whom she talks. You know, when, when she talks, people listen. 
Jerry's long road from Spice Girl to Ambassador was an amazing journey and one captured by British documentary maker Molly Deneen. Today is Thursday the 28th of May. I'm in Paris and um, yesterday I left Spice Girls. So I went out to meet her in Paris and I literally picked up the camera and she didn't stop talking for about five hours. It was just solid, solid, solid. And the irony of it all is that I would say I was the biggest wannabe. I was the biggest wannabe out of everybody. She was planning things, world-changing events that she was going to stage, books she was going to write, films she was going to make. So I'm putting together this fabulous book and it deals with self-esteem, self-worth, relationships, energy, mind, body and soul. I remember thinking, this is just complete pie in the sky. And you know, she's actually done most of it, which is amazing. Hey, so! Jerry auctioned off her ginger spice wardrobe and raised over £100,000 for the Sargent Cancer Care Centre for children in London. A month later, she signed on the line with EMI Records. And it's really hard work, particularly when you're on your own. You know, the, the pressure of being a solo artist when you don't have the security of a team of people around you to bounce things off all the time. And it can be, a, you know, a lonely place. For me to go into a studio, you know, by myself was kind of very, very daunting to begin with. Jerry would be the first to admit that in the period leading up to making this solo album, you know, self-doubt was an issue. You know, and then once the success came, you know, confidence came. I mean, once it started to work. Jerry's Spice success carried over into her solo career with the 1999 release of Schizophonic, her debut album, which proved she had staying power. Well, we've had three successive number one singles in the UK. Jerry has had more number ones in the UK now than any other female artist. Look at me. You can take it all because this face is free. Now Jerry finds herself poised for a future with a successful solo career already in the bag, an important role within the UN, and a renewed sense of balance in her life that she can finally call her own. I just want to be a good person. You know, one thing's for sure, I just want to maintain the ability to laugh at myself and enjoy life. It's so short. It really is. I'm sure she'll carry on and on and on doing what she's doing. Um, and she's great and she's good at it. She gives people pleasure, but I'm not sure how much pleasure she gives herself. I'd like to um, have a relationship with somebody, which I haven't got at the moment, but I'm looking. <laughs> but I'm pretending not to look, but I am really. <laughs> so send in your photos. She's like a wee puppy that uh, is always, you know, eager and searching for things and looking and eager to learn. I've suddenly realised, you know, it's like I had a, this, it was like climbing my mountain and I've realised that actually this is what I was born to do, is to entertain people. I love it. I really do. Take me back to my sweet La Vida, find my love, my Dolce Vita, show me where. Chico